So today's speaker is uh, Russ Richmond. Russ used to be a, a youth pastor here. He used to be young. <laughs> so did you. Uh, and, and so did I. Uh, I was noticing uh, the, the little Smith girl. I remember when Abby <clears throat> was that size. Um, Russ uh, is doing work with World Venture. Is it a bigger title than that? That's good. World Venture. Yeah. And uh, he'll tell you some more about that. Um, we're glad to have him fill in the pulpit today. Right on. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> well, it's uh, what a privilege to be here and so fun. What a joy to see what we're going to talk about today just lived out in front of us. I brought my part of my family here. We got Hope there, who, yes, she used to be on these sta the stairs. And uh, there's Abby as well. She was born while we were here. And then my mother in law, Judy, remember, she plays piano and stuff and still does. And then uh, my wife, Kristen. So they're here today. Uh, Grace and her new husband, Sean, are leading worship in a, their church. And uh, Will and his wife, Tammy, they're raising support to go to Indonesia. And so they're presenting at another church. I don't even know which church it is, but some other church today. And uh, he's, he's doing really well. The Lord's really blessing them. And so it's such a pleasure to be here, and especially um, just to get, the, get to meet you all again. It's been about a year since I've been here. So uh, if, you, if you forgive me, I'm just going to give you a little quick, quick update, just since it's been a whole year. And I'll keep it short. Uh, but I brought, I'm a missionary now, so I br bring slides and um, I have prayer cards and slides. I think that's all it takes. And uh, so this is a picture of our prayer card. Our kids don't like it because it's outdated, but uh, we'll make a new one soon. Um, just a year ago, we launched in the summer and we got prayed off and sent into World Venture to be uh, engaging our city with a missionary mindset. And uh, I help mobilize people to be disciple makers at home plus go to the nations. And so that's the, been this new adventure in our lives. We started right off like doing trainings and I'm doing training now. I've been doing training all year, trying to train people on how they can make disciples uh, right where they are with who they are. And, and, and so this is a picture of me and Will doing our first training uh, last summer. And then in the fall, it, life, that's how fast it goes. So. <laughs> If you're not right with the Lord, you better, you better get right, because it goes fast. Okay. Uh-oh. I'll let you. You want to get me to that slide? Okay. Oh, hey, Lynn. Thank you. And so in the fall, I got to go around and try to raise support and, and get partners from all over uh, the, the country with the relationships the Lord has me. And the person on the right, that's my youth pastor. That's my youth pastor. I had to go all the way to Missouri to catch up with him. And uh, they're upon our partner team. It was a wonderful time. And then once we hit 100%, we got full into raising the sales for a movement. Um, if that doesn't make much sense, I got a website that kind of helps you understand what that is about. But we're all about these seven sales of focusing on God's word, multiplying extraordinary prayer, casting vision, training believers, going out among the lost, seeing discovery groups start, and uh, ongoing coaching. Um, Right in January, I got to go back to the headquarters and be a part of one of this uh, send-offs, and it's a discovery weekend in Denver as our headquarters, and so that was uh, an important time for me uh, to, to be there. I've done more traveling this year than I have in a long time, and as mystic mystifying how exciting it seemed like it was going to be, and it has been, I'm, I'm kind of excited to stay at home for a while. But January, I helped with Mission Connection, which is this awesome conference in Portland, and uh, this is one of the workshops I helped coordinate and lead called uh, DMM, Disciple Making Movements. But we, uh, that thing's coming up in January again, and I'm helped coordinate the workshops. If you want to know about, about that, it's a really awesome opportunity to learn. In March, uh, my friend Ben Bobita, who runs this outreach in Independence uh, called The Gate, uh, he invited me to speak at their spring retreat, and there were a bunch of Dallas people there. And it was just a really good uh, refresher. And this is up at uh, Drift Creek. And I was teaching a, a camp. That was my first chance of doing a camp mixed with DMM training. And a lot of these kids learned how to do discovery Bible studies and took it home uh, to where they were. 
This church here, some of you might have seen it because I think a few of you have got married there. This is Oakville Presbyterian Church. It's in my neighborhood where I live. And these two guys in the picture are pastors from that church. And uh, in the last year, we've been investing in our neighborhood together because we're in the neighborhood. And that's a real big part of our dream is just to teach people to engage like we have been trying to do um, neighbors and students and international students and clubs, building relationships and then inviting people to follow Jesus. So that's been, the year has been full of that. This party I have a picture of happened on uh, June 21st. You guys know what that is? It's called the solstice. I was invited to a solstice party and I, we wanted to have a party for our neighbors and it, the details kind of fell apart. So we just went to the solstice party and uh, this, it was a pretty colorful event, I'll tell you. Um, but we made these couple contacts there that we invited over to our house for dinner. And even just last week, we've been building relationships with them. And it's been such a pleasure to see the Lord opening their hearts up to the gospel and talking about the Lord in, in, uh, in, with people who never would you know, darken the door of a church. April was a pretty big month because baby Owen came and I became a grandpa. And that's why I'm working on my grandpa beard right here. It's not that I forgot to shave. <clears throat> um, and so we were pleased, Will and Tammy had this beautiful little boy. And then the next day I took uh, uh, Hope out to Chile and she had a wonderful time serving with Will and uh, Eva Hughes. And so uh, I, I was there a week, she was there for two months and she had a great time. But I got to, if you see that little picture, I got to claim her, her room as my office while she was gone. So that's been one challenge is I've been uh, working from home. And so it's been, it's been a fun time. The Lord really worked uh, in that season. And then, um, this is kind of a little anachronistic, but in December, Grace got married to this guy, Sean. And then in May, her and Will both graduated from Corbin. So a lot of like family milestones this year. So it's been pretty exciting. Um, we started a, a thing called a DMM Go Group, which is like a missional community, the small group that's focused on going out and making disciples and being disciple makers, make disciples who make disciples. And so that was a big uh, goal for the year, and we did that in, in May. And May is also the month that we started this new access at downtown Corvallis. There's this thing called the Saturday Market. And look, these two people showed up at Kristen's a t-shirt booth. That's, we have a t-shirt booth down there, and it allows us to connect with so many different kinds of people, believers and unbelievers, and uh, we appreciate If you guys ever want to come down to Corvallis Saturday Market, look for us. We might be there. In the summer, I also got to speak at another camp way out east, Camp Elkanah. It's out near La Grande, and it kind of did the same thing, and it was really cool to see these high schoolers learn how to do discovery Bible studies, come, some of them coming to the Lord and, and bringing it home to their homes. And uh, so I got to have a, keep my youth, youthfulness going. And then in August, we invited this group from Texas and all over uh, to down to Corvallis where we did prayer walking. And we called it a push week, a, a DMM push week. And so some of my friends who do the similar thing up in Portland gathered together and it was a really exciting time. And about a couple weeks later, the Lord opened up this opportunity with Panera. Uh, I don't think you guys have Panera up here, but where we get their uh, day-end uh, donations, the, their day-old bread. And we've been using that as an opportunity to hand out to people as we're building relationships. And so there's this mobile home park nearby us that we have been giving them bread and then hanging around and trying to get in conversation. So it's been cool. I put this slide up here just because um, what part of our strategy is to take people to the nations to learn what disciple making movements about and how to make disciples in a global context and then bring that home and so we have a trip coming in uh in summer if any of you'd like to go to indonesia with me there's details you can just connect with me afterwards or get trained up i don't know how i did on the timing on that but that was my report really really awesome to get to report what god's doing but even more exciting is to get to be here on josiah's day so Josiah, I know Josiah. Um, Josiah and I met in Corvallis because our church down there, the sponsor or 
supported his parents. So I know his parents and him, and then I got to see him enter into Corbin. He lived in the same dorm as Will. And so cool, you got a good, you finally got a Bueller to be a youth pastor. I don't know how many times you've heard that, but that might mean that the Lord is coming back soon. Uh, and I just really, it's a pleasure to get to, I asked Dave, what are you guys going through? What do you want me to preach on? Because, uh, you know, he's, you know, um, being with his family on this weekend. And he said, I'll talk whatever you want, but it is going to be Josiah's first uh, week. So maybe something about the next generation. I'm like, oh, okay, I love talking about that. And then what a privilege to get to do this for Josiah. So I uh, just want to remind us how important it is. And, and especially in the history of Salt Creek, the next generation has always been a high value here. And it's, it's a privilege to, to challenge you. It has been a privilege for me to walk in that, that stream. And at first, um, our man over here, I'm blanking on your name right now, but Vince, of course, Vince Rediger, I know him. <laughs> uh, he gets to be here too. He was saying it's like the three Spider-Mans, uh, multiverses. <laughs> so, so this is going to apply to our passage. If I have time, I'll share how this applies, the three different generations here. But cool to pass that off, uh, pass on the, the baton, the torch to the next guy who's going to invest in the youth here. It's a worthwhile investment. Amen? Yeah, say, raise your hand if you've ever been a youth, in the, a youth group here at Salt Creek. I know this guy, awesome. Praise God, man. What a, what a legacy of ministering to teens and, and treating them like they're important, that they're a part. They're, um, I love how you guys invest money, prayer, heart into the young people. And so this, I remember how cool it was when I first realized that one of the charter members of this church was named Jacob Bueller, and I had a guy named Jacob Bueller in my youth group. And I just really felt like I was having to steward this amazing legacy, not all alone, but, um, and so, what a cool thing. I, as I was here, I think I, the Lord really, because I came from California, I really got my eyes open to the idea of these things called seasons, and also, um, <laughs> Legacy, generation, for lack of a better word, pedigree, you know what I mean? Like f tracking the legacy down to where you are and keeping it up, the next generation, however the Lord's calling you to do. So it's a, this is an awesome place, and I, I don't think of a better passage than Deuteronomy 6 to talk about having a strong legacy and what the Lord says about how you make sure your legacy is strong. How do you make sure you build a bridge of faith from generation to generation? So although um, Tracy read the whole chapter, we're only going to focus on verse 4 through 10. I asked him to read the whole chapter. Um, but I want to read it again. And I want you to listen to God's voice as he speaks to you. And uh, we're going to just trust that he is going to direct us. He's going to give us the tweak we need to make sure we are faithful in our generation. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant, and when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. I just want us to spend some time looking at this passage. Actually, I read one extra verse that I shouldn't have um, for the, what I want to do. But look at verse 4 through 9. In fact, what I'd like you to do is with one or two people behind, uh, to your side, would you just read it together, verse 4 through 9? And then after you read it, pick one person to read it, then you all share something that stands out to you from it. Would you do that? I'll just give you a few minutes. Verses 4 through 9, somebody, one or two beside you, 
read that and share what stands out to you. Check, 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 one, two. Yeah. I'll give you two more minutes. Okay, 30 seconds. Okay, um, could, I, could I hear two, two things that stood out to people? Maybe one from this side and I'll get one from this side. What's one, something that stood out to you from this passage? What's that? I'm not here normally, so I don't know if you, don't, you do this normally or not. And if you don't, don't worry. Go for it. Anybody, what, what stood out to you? Or maybe you could tell me something somebody else said. You blame it on them. The Shema. Yeah. That Hebrew word. We're going to talk about that just a tad. Awesome. What Over here, what st- stood out to you? There's only one God. There's only one God. There's only one God. That's, that's like a, a central part. The, the Israelites would quote this every day. They call it the Shema. A hero Israel. In fact, they had a song. I learned it in uh, seminary. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adashem Achad. It was just this phrase that was like their, their confession. Now, what stood out to me and what I think I, I want to just kind of pull out to us is a couple important things that we need to do if we're going to build a bridge of faith from generation to generation. Because that's what he's warned them about. You're going to this new land and you need to stay faithful. And the first thing you need to do is you have to have a contagious love for God and then have a pervasive spiritual conversations. You need to make unforgettable memorials. So unforgettable memorial making and then take intergenerational partnership. So I have them all there. I didn't print it anywhere. So if you want to remember it, you could uh, write them down. But contagious love for God, that's where it starts. If, If parents... If one generation doesn't think something is valuable enough and exciting enough, the next generation will never catch it. There's got to be a contagious love for God. And notice how he says it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. All your uh, heart 
is kind of the central part of your desires and who you are. Your soul is everything immaterial about you. And your might is like the passion, the thing that you really give all your energies to. So think about this. He mentions three parts of you, but he only mentions one God. So we need to unite all of the parts of us and we need to focus them on the Lord. Is that what we are per- displaying? Is that what our lives are life? Do we have a contagious love for God? If I asked you, who is it that you know that's got a contagious love for God, who would you say that was? And then why would you say that is? Now, normally you might think it was some effervescent, outgoing person who's always talking about Jesus all the time and is really rah, rah. And, and that's, I tend to think of that. I tend to think of the first person that came to my mind the other day was um, for, I don't know why, but it was Melanie Mansell. I don't know if any of you, you know, know her or have known her. Um, she just, she just oozed with, she would talk about the father, the relationship she had with the father when I served with her in Sunday school. And, and, I, and I think about a person like that. But, but, you know, there's different ways to love God than just overflowing, like not everyone's the same. God's people are different with different temperaments and different personalities. And just like we have five love languages, there's people who specialize in loving God in different ways. There's some people who just are super generous and give. That's the way they show their love for God. Other people, they spend their time and they serve and they, they hang out in the booth and they make sure all the sound stuff works. You know, they have this contagious uh, desire to keep... Um, things going. They want to serve the Lord. There's others who, who just want to go alone and be with the Lord and oh, I mean, just sit on his lap, you know. And, but uh, however it is that you love God, f- keep it stoked. Keep that fire burning. And Josiah, as you, get, as you lead the youth group, and I saw your title was family minister, but you're going to do it in youth, right? Okay, good. Okay, so I was just a you know, little old youth pastor. I didn't have a family, but... Um, <laughs> But that needs to be, that's something that's set from the top, it's set in the core, and it's to have a DNA of a youth group where this is a place where people who get together and love God, and it's cool to be excited about Jesus. It's cool to, you you notice that'll happen, a culture will get set where, say, learning doesn't seem that cool to, to a certain group of people, or this thing doesn't seem too cool to people. It needs to be cool. We need to create a culture in our church, in our youth ministry, and more importantly, in our families where loving and worshiping and enjoying and delighting in and having fun with God and following God is just saturating it. That's the best. That's, that's where we start. And we start with uh, prayer. We start with worship. We start with serving God in a dedicated way. Have a contagious love for God. That's the first step. First way to build the bridge. It's kind of like the foundation of this bridge to the next generation. The second one is pervasive spiritual conversations. Pervasive spiritual conversations. How does he say it in verse 7? He says, You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Now, raise your hand if you have or have had teenage kids. Anybody? Okay. So you can testify to me what that feels like to be a parent who always brings up the same thing over and over and over. And you're like, Lord, why would you ask me to do that? Like, they're going to think, they're going to tell me to shut up. But he says, I want you to always bring it back to me. I want you to live a lifestyle where you're always talking about the statutes because they apply to all of life. Check this out. If God isn't relevant to all of life, then we're going to seem hypocritical. Why do people leave the church? As I've been going and hanging out with more and more lost people, people who don't go to church or haven't gone to church, most of them, it's, a, it's been a, quite a surprise this year because in, you think about Corvallis, and I don't know what prejudices you have about that city, but you may have a prejudice about it as being maybe more secular, um, more kind of out there. Um, Most people that I've run into, even the ones that are doing crazy things, like have Buddha statues and stuff like that, they're only one or two generations away from the church. So somehow the faith didn't, didn't get ingrained into them. And most of the reasons the people use is that their parents or 
Christians in their life were hypocritical. Now, I think that in some way that can be a, you know, can be a cop-out. It could be an excuse. But if we don't bring God into all of life, if God is the creator of all life, but we don't live our whole life as if God is the creator of all that life, then kids pick up on the disharmony there. It's like, hey, I thought this was supposed to make the big difference, but I don't see any difference between the way we're living and the way the world's living. There's got to be a difference, and this is how it makes a difference. We bring God into everything. So we get annoying at times, okay? We go to McDonald's and we pray for our meal at McDonald's, okay? We walk and we talk. When we watch a movie, the dad, like me, is the annoying guy who says, what does this teach us about God? What, is this, what can we talk about our faith at the end of this movie? And the kids are like, why do you always do that, Dad? I don't want to talk about it. I just want to enjoy it. In our um, training, our DMM training, we, uh, we talk about the Shema lifestyle. And that is what he's talking about here. The word Shema means to listen or hear like we translate it, but it also means to obey. And then that obedience is an obedience that goes into all of our life. So kind of a, a more modern way to say everyday Shema or live a Shema lifestyle is to live out loud your love for Jesus. To do words and actions that point to your faith in God. Now many people in here are loving, generous people. I know because I've lived with you and I, and I know you. Um, you've, you do wonderful things words and are wonderful things out of your love for God, whether you serve in the community or give or help or, and, and that is awesome. That's, that's really the key to showing the world that God makes a difference because it's not something we just come and do on Sunday. It's something that impacts everything we do, the way we do business, the way we uh, hang out in town, the way we do business in town, the way we uh, go to school, the whole nine yards. But sh- a uh, Shema lifestyle is about doing Shema actions and statements as two sides of one coin all throughout our lives. Now, you're either one, usually you're either one or the other. Um, you, you're either a words person or an actions person. I mean, as far as like your proclivity, like your strength. Some people like to talk a lot. Um, other people like to not talk, you know. We need to do both. The problem with doing just words is what? Like when someone just talks God, but they don't do any actions, what do we call them? A hypocrite, right? But what's the, so we need to add the actions. What if you do actions, but you don't do words? What's the problem with that? There's a critical problem in that. Because people say, oh, you know, I preach gospel with my actions. The problem, if you don't add words that point it to God, they just think you're nice. They just think you're cool. They just think you're generous. And what's horrible about that is that you're, you're getting the credit for what God did. Now, how do you cure that? How do you fix that? It's really simple. It's just when you do something for somebody that's kind and they tell you how great it is, you can practice saying something that points it to God. Like, Oh, that was so kind. You could say something like, well, the Lord has been so kind to me. I love to show kindness to others. Or they could say, oh, man, I wouldn't have been able to do that unless you came over and helped me. He says, oh, I'm glad I could do that. The Lord has sent people to help me in my hard times too. And I'm glad that he's used me in your life. So just something simple. do not have to be weird, but always pointing it back to God. And what's cool about that is that these Shema actions and statements can lead to... Um, further conversations about the gospel. Like when you bring up God's name in these everyday circumstances, people who are hungry for God, hungry for spiritual things, will kind of be shown and show themselves. And you can then lead them in more steps, even to the point where you're inviting them to study God's word with you. So do all kinds of things. And in your youth ministries, do all kinds of crazy stuff, you know. Go out and shoot guns, go and play video games and eat bunches of pizza. And your body can handle it at this age, so it's cool. But just remember, you'll be my age sometime, so, so plan ahead. So, so we, we have contagious love for God, pervasive spiritual conversations. The third is unforgettable memorial making. Now, I brought a picture of, uh, 
this memorial that uh, we saw when we went to Plymouth, um, Massachusetts, actually just last week, that, is, that helps us remember what the people on the Mayflower stood for. And it has their names on it, and it's this beautiful thing. If you ever go to Plymouth, make sure you see that. It's, it's kind of like hidden back behind um, the, uh, the neighborhoods. But, uh, but I didn't even need to bring that picture because what a cool picture is this. We've got a memorial right here that reminds us of the 40 years that Clarence um, led these backpacks. And I got to go on two of them. So just to think he did 38 more than that. Wow. Um, but I don't know. His grandkids are going to look at that and go, what's that about? And he can tell the stories of all the ones. And um, because those T-shirts, he has all these T-shirts. Those will probably wear out someday. But that rock, it's going to take longer to wear out. And, uh, and, and to tell the stories. Think about in your life. In this passage here, it says to write the statutes. Um, write them on. I'm trying to find it. Verse 8. You shall bind them a sign on your hand. And you, they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. There's other stories where they're told to put up memorial stones, but that is a really important piece to always tell the stories to the next generation so they remember the faithfulness of God and they pass it down. And that is a key part of a family is to pass on the stories. I was just thinking about this recently, or just as I was studying this in verse 2, it says, may Uh, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments. He says that you need to fear the Lord. You do, your son does, and your son's sons. Isn't it interesting that he picks three generations there? And now that I'm a grandpa, I'm like, hey, I I can fulfill that. But the Lord in his wisdom made us to where without, you know, the the odd thing happening, we can see three, we could be a part of three generations. The Lord made us to where right now our life expectancy, I just did a little research, life expectancy, although it's going down, which is an interesting thing in our day and age, is about 76 years old. That's the the life expectancy in America. The average age someone has their first kid is, anybody want to guess? 23, or 25, I'm sorry, 25. So that means you have your first kid at 25, then they have their first kid when you're 50, and they have, that kid has a kid when you're 75. In God's plan, he has made us to be able to span the generational passing of the baton so that we all can be a part of it the whole time of our life. The first segment of our life, we're owning our own faith, We're going deep in our own relationship with the Lord. Our parents are helping us, the other people around us. And then we have our, in the next generation, we're having our kids and we're instilling it in them. Meanwhile, we're asking our parents, hey, how do you do this? And uh, they're helping us. And then once that happens and they get married and they have kids, then we can help them pass on to their kids. Isn't that a beautiful design of the Lord? And so that's why the last thing is, intergenerational partnerships. I really think that that is an important piece of, of living for God, is to, is to join the generations together in uh, activities and projects that unite us. There's something in our heart. There's something in a young person's heart where they want to work with their parents, their father. At least it was in me really strong. My dad was a fireman. And then he was an appraiser, and I kind of like tried to learn the business until the Lord called me off into the ministry. But there was something in me that really wanted to do that. And then when I was raising my sons and daughters, I kind of wanted to join in, my, in what I was doing. And some of you have had the privilege of having a, a family business like that. And you know the kind of complications that that brings to your life, and we could talk forever about that. But it's really beautiful when you look in the Bible, there's this key theme where God wants his son to rule and work with him. And in Psalm 110, Psalm 110, he talks about David. He talks about, says to David, you are my son, today I've begotten you. And then he says, sit in my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And Jesus picks up the theme 
where he's always saying, I see the Father work and I work. And this has really been a key healing point in my life as I've kind of dealt with the complication and the, the interesting piece of am I fulfilling my father's uh, passions for me? Are my kids joining in my ministry? Just that whole ball of wax of my life. The Lord has taught me this mantra that he and I, God and me, were in this ministry together. You know, as we try to reach people for the Lord, we're reminded of the promises that um, no one can come to Jesus unless the Father draws him. That, every, every, that we go and where we go, the Lord is. And that he's involved with us. And we're in this partnership together. And just like David found his purpose that God had for him and he lived it out, that's our call in our generation. And so we read this of David in Acts 13, 36. David, after he had served... Let me get it up here. David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep. So think about where we are in history. Think about what God's trying to do, what God is doing, and join him in it. There's a lot talked about that you need to find your own way. And there's a part of that that's true, but it's, it's more like find your part of what God's doing and get involved in what God's doing, us, his children, him, our father. And what's beautiful is when the generations can unite together and work on winning this world with, with together for the Lord and we can make disciples together and we could support one another and pray for one another and be on each other's team and be in the grandstands for one another. That's what is the beauty of the generations working together. So as we, as we close looking at this passage, I just ask you to, to ask the Lord, or maybe it's clear already, what, what is he telling you today to focus on? What's that one thing that you can do to obey his word right now, to, to hear and obey? Is it this contagious love for God? Is it the pervasive spiritual conversations, the unforgettable memorial making, or the intergenerational partnership? Or maybe it's just something else. But the important part of hearing God's word is not just to say, check the box, I heard it, or to learn something new, but is to do something. That's what it really means to be a disciple. You know, I've been talking about my ministry is about teaching people to make disciples that make disciples. And so people think I've got this new insight on what disciples are. But really, all a disciple is is someone who's following Jesus and does what he tells them to do. It's as simple as that. And you can't help someone else do that if you're not doing it yourself. So let me pray for you. And whatever the Lord's putting on your heart, I just encourage you and challenge you to obey. Because just as he says in this passage, it will go well with you when you obey the Lord. Lord, we thank you for your love and thank you for the opportunity to be in front of your word today. And I just ask that you would continue to speak as we wind up today uh, together. May your your work of speaking to our hearts, of giving us a, a church, a community that passes it on to the next generation, maybe one that is calling people back to the faith they've forgotten. We ask God for your favor in this. We ask for your spirit to move. And we ask that you would be exalted as the one God. In your name, amen.